The Return of Sidney Rigdon, God's Spokesman This is the testimony, last of all, that we give of him. Tribute to Sidney Rigdon by One Who's Watching, Part 1 Much of what I write and blog about regarding the marvelous work and a wonder is directly related to the life and calling of Joseph Smith, Jr., the prophet of the last dispensation. Next to the Savior himself, Joseph Smith appears to be the primary servant upon which the restoration of the church and the future marvelous work seems to revolve around. I suppose some people feel that I border on worshiping him. My feelings for him and what God's word tells us about his past and future mission uh, cannot be adequately described. In this article, however, I want to hyper-focus on, pay tribute to, one of the many other fascinating personalities that was drawn to the light of the gospel, a person who arguably played as important a role in the Restoration Movement as Brother Joseph. As I have poured over church historical documents during the last 20 years trying to get a better understanding of the LDS Restoration Movement and the endless array of fascinating personalities that were drawn to the Prophet Joseph Smith and the restoration of the Gospel, I've gained a profound love and respect for many of these people. They lived in amazing times, Pentecostal times, but trying times. There have been periods when I have been so impressed in reading historical records about these people that I felt as if I could glimpse what it must have been like living in Kirtland or Nauvoo among the saints, but usually I have simply felt the frustration of feeling as if I had been born in the wrong time period. Although I love all of the players who gravitated to the light of the restored gospel, I must confess I feel closer to some than others. I revere some more than others. One personality that I really resonate with is Sidney Rigdon. My heart loves Brother Sidney. He is one of my heroes. I believe that when his mission and ministry is finally completed, it will be said of him that he was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. In this article, I'm going to spotlight what God said to and about him, and for those who have the faith to believe what God has said, the proof will be indisputable that he was indeed already a great prophet during the first part of his earthly ministry. After he returns and completes his assignments, he certainly will be one of the greatest prophets in the short history of this earth. Next to the prophet Joseph Smith, Sidney is one of the most misunderstood, underrated, and maligned personalities of the LDS Restoration Movement. It is interesting how so many scoffers, critics, and historical revisionists in and out of the church have made such a concerted effort to show him in a bad light and to discredit him. Authors and researchers have characterized Rigdon as a pathetic, deluded portrait of religious excess. Of the many scoffers who have taken an interest in the LDS Restoration Movement, perhaps Richard Van Wagner has put together the most comprehensive compilation of historical information on Rigdon. He has done a world-class job of building upon the foundation of many historians and researchers that preceded him. I really appreciate the information provided by Van Wagner about Rigdon, and it's my sincere hope that Van Wagner and others of his ilk will repent before their probationary experience has expired. Because of time restraints and ADHD, I have not been able to provide footnotes for every historical reference in this article. However, any reference not noted will probably be found in his book. It is perhaps somewhat ironic that Sidney taught the following truth to his students in the School of the Prophets. Quote, Let us here observe that a religion that does not acquire the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. End of quote. And another, For a man to lay down his all, his character and reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among men, his houses, his lands, his brothers and sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life also, counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
requires more than mere belief or supposition that he's doing the will of God, but actual knowledge, realizing that when those sufferings are ended, he will enter into eternal rest and be a partaker of the glory of God. If ever one of the Lord's anointed sacrificed his good name and reputation in the cause of Christ, certainly Rigdon did. I promise you that if you will study the history of Rigdon through the lens of Christ's words to and about him, you will never view him in the same way again. I realize that Rigdon was far from perfect. Yes, he had some flaws and shortcomings. The prophet Joseph Smith apparently pointed a few of them out. The Lord pointed out a few of his imperfections and rebuked and corrected him on a few occasions, as he did Joseph. He did tend to be a little bit reactionary and perhaps even a bit eccentric, and certainly he was a religious fanatic, just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, John the Baptist, Jesus, etc. And he may have said a few things in poor taste, but then he was suffering for the cause of Christ in ways that none of us will probably ever fully comprehend. Unfortunately, he may be best remembered by some for his salt sermon and the July 4th oration given in Far West in which he alienated some of the early members of the church and some of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. He also threatened retaliation upon the enemies of the church and incited a great deal of persecution against the church. Others have characterized him as the primary contestant and would-be usurper in the succession crisis of 1844. One of the things we are often reminded about Sidney Rigdon is that he kind of went into a hibernation state during the later years of the ministry. During this time, the saints did not hear much from him. His health and other events silenced him and took the edge off the charismatic energy that so characterized the first seven years of his ministry. During the first seven years, he and the prophet Joseph Smith were inseparable but it appears that his relationship with the prophet was somewhat strained for a period of time following that. Although that rift between Smith and Rigdon was embellished in the sanitized version of the history of the church, it was real, and there was a legitimate reason for it, as we shall see. We will review what history and revelation has to tell us about the silencing of God's appointed spokesman, Sidney Rigdon. I've realized that when I compare the characterization of authors and historical revisionists with the words of the Lord concerning Brigden and his associated efforts in behalf of the restored gospel, that there is a real discrepancy. I've chosen to go with the Lord's version of Sidney Rigdon. That is the version of Sidney Rigdon you will read about in this article. By doing keyword searches in the DNC, of the different personalities of the Restoration Movement and the gifts and callings bestowed upon them by the Lord, it becomes apparent that Sidney Rigdon was second only to Joseph Smith in prominence and importance. Oliver Cowdery, another maligned personality with another incredible calling. It's important when reading what the holy and infallible Word of God has to say to and about Sidney Rigdon that God knows all things that all things, past, present, and future, are continually before God's eyes, and that he therefore has seen every person's future actions. He has the advantage of infinite foreknowledge when choosing his servants. Yes, I realize that God sometimes intentionally chooses people to serve when he knows full well that they will not be valiant. He uses such people as pawns to bring about his purposes, Judas is someone God intentionally called to a high position, knowing full well what would take place. Satan was also placed in a position of authority under God's direction so that he could fall and fulfill the eternal purposes of an all-knowing God. The information contained in this article will enable you to better judge for yourself if Rigdon is a Judas, as some ha would have you believe, or whether he was a prophet who was rejected by a fallen people. The proposition of this article is that Rigdon was and is the real deal according to the Word of God. If ever there was a man during the LDS Restoration Movement other than the prophet Joseph Smith who was specifically identified by the Word of God as a prophet, it was Sidney Rigdon. God does not predict future events based on historical data and then come up with an actuarial determination of what the probabilities are that a certain event will happen with a fallible degree of accuracy. 
When God gives an unconditional promise that a future event will take place, it's because He's already seen the future. Now, let me repeat that. God has already seen the future take place. We who live in time have a chronological perception of events as they take place, but God does not reside in time. He resides in eternity. His comprehension is not finite. It is infinite. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In order to unlock the hidden treasures of knowledge in modern revelation, as well as having one's eyes opened about who Sidney Rigdon is and what his calling was and is, one must have the faith to believe the following promise of God as contained in section 1 of the DNC. Quote, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servant. It is the same. End of quote. DNC 1, 37 and 38. That commandment and promise really tries the soul of those who take it seriously because modern revelation is full of specific, unconditional promises to individuals that clearly were not fulfilled prior to their passing away in the flesh. Do you have the faith to believe God can return people to the earth in a very strange act? In order for the eternal and infallible Word of God to come true, people like Joseph and Sidney must be returned to the earth to fulfill their callings. The infallible Word of God has spoken it. If you're not familiar with the doctrine of the Second Commission in the Third Watch, please take time to view review this incredible truth. It will help to unlock your understanding of modern revelation and the relationship between the foundation work of the 30, 1830s and 40s and the marvelous work in a wonder that is about to come forth. It will better enable you to understand the treasures of knowledge contained in modern revelation that are spotlighted in this article. It's very important that you understand that the first commission of Joseph and Sidney back in the 1830s and 40s was referred to by the Lord as laying the foundation. The marvelous work spoken of by the ancient prophets was to come forth four generations after the foundation was laid. And uh, if you get this online, it says click here to learn more about the foundation work and the marvelous work. So there's a link right here. And it's on the one who's watching dot wordpress dot com. I believe that's it. One of the reasons the commandment and promise of the Lord in section one is difficult to accept is because we latter day saints have lost much of the truth about the nature of God and the reality that he knows all things and cannot lie. His unconditional promises about the future always come to pass. In fact, we shall see as we proceed that the Doctrine and Covenants originally was composed of two parts. The first part was the Doctrine portion, uh, and it, it's, it was comprised of what is now called Lectures on Faith. The Lectures on Faith was taken from a series of lectures taught by Sidney Rigdon in the School of the Prophets. Recent authorship studies ascribe the wording of the lectures mainly to Sidney Rigdon, with Joseph Smith substantially involved. The second part of the canon was the covenants portion of it, which was comprised of the revelations received by Joseph Smith. I'm not sure if Watcher covers this, but in the uh, preface of the original lectures on faith, you have a testimony from Joseph and Sidney and I believe Oliver and Frederick Tree Williams. And they all say that they, uh, you know, they sign their names, that what they've written, that they'll be held accountable for it at some point, and that they ascribe that it is true. So um, that's very, very powerful to me. Uh, let's see, the doctrine part at the DNC was placed first in the canon of Scripture, among other reasons, because it taught that we cannot exercise faith in a God that does not know all things. It declares the eternal truth that God does indeed know all things and he cannot lie. Quote, 
Why is the correct idea of God's character, perfections, and attributes necessary? Without the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity, men could not exercise faith in Him for life and salvation, seeing that without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of His creatures. For it is the knowledge which He has of all things from the beginning to the end that enables Him to give that understanding to His creatures, by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God has all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in Him. End of quote. That's in Lectures on Faith. In a discourse at Brigham Young University, Elder McConkie quoted certain portions of the lectures that dealt with the deity and praised them as follows. In my judgment, it is the most comprehensive, intelligent, inspired utterance that now exists in the English language that exists in one place defining, interpreting, expounding, announcing, and testifying what kind of being God is. It is written by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the spirit of inspiration. It is, in effect, eternal scripture." End of quote. On this particular issue, I am compelled to agree with Brother McConkie. The lectures on faith were rightly sustained as the inspired doctrine of the Church, the contents of which is particularly necessary to understand in order to understand and believe the promises and prophecies contained in the revelations Joseph Smith brought forth. Unfortunately, after being part of the Scriptures and being sustained as Scriptures for 86 years, the Word of God known as the Doctrine and Covenants was rent asunder in 1921 when the Doctrine portion was removed from the Doctrine and Covenants. Apparently, as the church membership became more darkened in their minds, some of the truths contained in the lectures on faith were deemed questionable and controversial, and therefore that part of the canon of Scripture was downgraded as something profitable for study, but not quite the status of Scripture. Lectures on Faith in D&C 1, 37 and 38 teaches us that we can know assuredly that when the Lord calls specific individuals to important callings and prophecies unconditionally, that they will accomplish certain things, we can take it to the bank. We can be sure that those things will be accomplished, and we would do well to show a certain degree of respect for those who have been called and anointed by the Lord, regardless of how well they are or are not respected by scoffers in the peanut gallery. I've already shown in previous posts that according to God's infinite, eternal, and infallible word, Joseph Smith and the first laborers in the last kingdom will return to the Lord's vineyard to finish their callings. This is something else that there's a link for the first laborers in the last kingdom, explaining who they are and, and uh, what they'll be doing. Rigdon is one of the God's servants who will return. He is one of the first elders of the church. He is one of the first laborers in the last kingdom. Again, in this tribute to Sidney Rigdon, I want to highlight the most significant aspects of his attributes gifts and callings that God points out in modern revelation and that the events of history testify of. The purpose of this article is to document from the Word of God the past and present role that Brother Sidney plays in God's overall plan and in the marvelous work that is about to begin. From the statements concerning Sidney Rigdon contained in 12 sections of the DNC, we shall create a profile of Sidney Rigdon. Once you view this profile and have the faith to believe it, there will be no question in your mind that he will be one of the greatest prophets to ever walk the earth. I will show from twelve revelations contained in the DNC that all address Sidney Rigdon by name, that this world has not seen the last of Sidney Rigdon, nor is the succession issue that began in 1844 over with. Brother Sidney and Brother Joseph are scheduled to return to this earth in one form or another in the near future and all of us would be wise to prepare our hearts and our minds for the great test that is coming. The Lord tells us in section 1 that knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, end of quote, he gave commandments to Joseph Smith and others that the prophecies of the prophets might be fulfilled. So what are the prophecies of the prophets that need to be fulfilled? And... Um, Watcher said in one form or another that he'd return. I think he meant um, in uh, returned back in a mortal state or a translated state. He doesn't mean as somebody else. He'll come back as himself.
Jeremiah spoke of the calamity that would come upon Israel at the time of her visitation. Virtually all of the Old Testament prophets prophesied of a calamity that would take place in the end times. They sometimes refer to it as the controversy. Isaiah calls it the controversy of Zion. All of these have links to them, by the way. Jeremiah notes that God will have a controversy with the nations. Hosea informs us that the Lord will have a controversy with Israel. Micah declares that God is going to have a controversy wherein he will plead with Israel. The calamity spoken of by Jeremiah is mentioned in the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, wherein we are comforted by the fact that God's people will be delivered from the calamity of the wicked. Quote, we know that thou hast spoken by the mouth of thy prophets terrible things concerning the wicked in the last days, that, there will thy, that thou wilt pour out judgments without measure. Therefore, O Lord, deliver thy people from the calamity of the wicked. Enable thy servants to seal up the law and bind up the testimony, that they may be prepared against the day of burning. Doctrine and Covenants 109, 45, and 46. This deliverance of God's people from the calamity of the wicked takes place in the third watch when the servants go forth for the last time to seal up the law. Quote, Therefore tarry ye and labor diligently that you may be perfected in your ministry to go forth among the Gentiles for the last time, as many as the mouth of the Lord shall name, to bind up the law and seal up the testimony, and to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment which is to come. End of quote. D&C 8884. When the servants are returned to the earth in the third watch, the scriptures refer to this as the time when the weak things of the earth come forth to break down the mighty and strong ones. Now look what the Lord reveals in section 1. Quote, Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spoke unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets, the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. This is the section of scripture I am using to lay the foundation of the rest of this tribute. I am not including it as one of the twelve sections that I create the profile of Sidney Rigdon from, because these verses don't specifically mention Sidney Rigdon's name like the other twelve sections do. Nevertheless, this incredible section of scripture lays the foundation in that it makes a grand distinction between Joseph Smith's calling in the third watch and others. Joseph is to receive the commandments while others proclaim them. So who are the others besides Joseph Smith that have been commanded to proclaim the commandments after Joseph Smith brings them forth? The answer to that question is one of the grand keys having to do with the marvelous work that will try the souls of men. While Joseph was commanded to receive commandments preparatory to the marvelous work, others were commanded to go forth in power and proclaim them. By doing a keyword search using the word proclaim, you will find numerous elders who were called to proclaim the gospel in the second watch, and those who are valiant will return to the vineyard in the third watch to proclaim the gospel. But the primary one identified to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord and the gospel of salvation in both the second watch and the third watch is Sidney Rigdon. Notice how the Lord speaks to all three members of the First Presidency, but it is Sidney Rigdon that is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Quote, now I say unto you, my friends, let my servant Sidney Rigdon go on his journey and make haste, and also proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the gospel of salvation, as I shall give him utterance. And by your prayer of faith, with one consent, I will uphold him. And let my servants Joseph Smith, Jr., and Frederick G. Williams make haste also, and it shall be given them according to the prayer of faith. And inasmuch as you keep my sayings, you shall not be confounded in this world, nor in the world to come. And verily I say unto you, that it is my will that you should hasten to translate my scriptures, and to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries, and 
and of kingdoms, of laws of God and man, and all this for the salvation of Zion. Amen. DNC 93 51. How do we know that this calling of Sidney Rigdon's to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord pertains to the third watch as well as the second watch? I'm going to paraphrase an incredible secret revealed in section 90 of the DNC. You compare it to the actual verses and see if you don't agree with my interpretation. Notice the wording. It is clearly speaking about the marvelous work in a wonder, when the dispensation of the fullness of times has come in and the gospel is going forth for the last time. Quote, that through the administration of Joseph Smith, Sidney, and Frederick may receive the word, and through the administration of Sidney and Frederick, the word may go forth unto the ends of the earth, unto the Gentiles first, and then, behold and lo, they shall turn unto the Jews. And then cometh the day when the arm of the Lord shall be revealed in power, in convincing the nations, the heathen nations, the house of Joseph, of the gospel of their salvation. Those who can discern the signs of the times realize that the calamity and controversy spoken of by the ancient prophets is about to take place. Are you ready for it? Using unconditional promises and commandments from the Lord from 12 different revelations, we will create a profile of who Sidney Rigdon really was and is. We shall see into the soul of Sidney Rigdon from God's perspective rather than from the perspective of mockers and scoffers. After we document and profile and review the profile of Sidney in the context of several significant historical events and God's infallible word, we'll review parts of a document that was suppressed for many years, one that shows what really took place in the church trial that excommunicated Sidney Rigdon. I'm also going to make public, for the first time to my knowledge, a discourse given by Sidney Rigdon that still needs to be transcribed from the Pittman shorthand notes taken by Thomas Bullock, one of the scribes of the Prophet Joseph Smith. The discourse is one that Rigdon gave during the succession crisis in Nauvoo. I will also provide some remarkable prophecies from a cryptic revelation that has also been rejected and suppressed for many years. Before we begin profiling Brother Sidney according to the word of the Lord in modern revelation, let us begin by remembering that long before Rigdon converted to Mormonism, he was prepared by the Lord for the work he was appointed to do. He became a major player in the Reformed Baptist movement and he was considered to be one of the great religious orders in America. Additionally, he was considered by many to be one of the great doctrinal scholars of his time. Sidney Rigdon stated that in his earliest infancy, the fear of God, quote, was the ruling principle in his heart. In consequence of this, he was devoted to the study of the Bible, end of quote. Rigdon's son, Wycliffe, who eventually became an attorney, noted that his father, quote, was as familiar with the Bible as a child with his spelling book, end of quote. Friends of Rigdon in the Reformed Baptist movement often referred to him as a walking Bible. David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, wrote, quote, Rigdon was a thorough Bible scholar, a man of fine education and a powerful orator. He soon, wor soon worked himself deep into Brother Joseph's affections and had more influence over him than any other man living. He was Brother Joseph's private counselor and his most intimate friend and brother for time, for some time after they met. Brother Joseph rejoiced, believing that the Lord had sent to him this great and mighty man, Sidney Rigdon, to help him in the work. Interestingly, in a revelation that Rigdon received later in life, the Lord stated that, quote, there was no man living so well qualified to judge the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon as he was. His knowledge of the Lord's manner of writing was such as enabled him to detect it when he saw it, and thus it was that he received the Book of Mormon when I, the Lord, sent it to him." End of quote. Another complimentary attribute of Rigdon's was his incredible speaking skills. Rigdon was arguably the greatest orator in America at that time. 
Alexander Campbell referred to Rigdon as the great orator of the Mahoning Association. Prior to his conversion, he was a close associate of Alexander Campbell, who, despite the fact that Campbell rejected the gospel, was one of the great religious thinkers and doctrinal scholars of his day, and who made a huge impact in the development of Christianity in America in the 1830s and 1840s. On my mission in the Bible Belt of the 70s, I came across many Church of Christ preachers and read much of their literature. I must have heard the following phrase a hundred times. Quote, when the Bible speaks, we speak. When the Bible is silent, we are silent. End of quote. That statement was coined by Alexander Campbell. One of the doctrines that Rigdon and Campbell disagreed on with regard to practicing it, however, in their shared desire to live in strict accordance with the pattern of Christianity set forth in the Bible, was the New Testament teaching that the church needed to live in a communal setting, having all things in common. Another issue they parted ways over is the need for the continued blessing associated with spiritual gifts. Quote, Rigdon continued his search for truth and began developing his own theology. As a result, Rigdon's thinking and Campbell's thinking separated. F. Mark McKiernan, Rigdon's Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints biographer, illustrates this by drawing a distinction in the way the two men viewed creeds. McKiernan says Campbell rejected creeds because they were divisive. Rigdon rejected creeds because they were unscriptural. It soon became obvious that Rigdon accepted the continuance of miraculous spiritual gifts, while Campbell believed these existed only in the apostolic church. Friction grew between the two men between 1830. Rigdon and Campbell argued most over the issue of the restoration of a communal society. At the 1830 Mahoning Association meeting, Rigdon, quote, introduced an argument to show that our pretensions to follow the apostles in all their New Testament teachings required a community of goods, that as they established their order in the model church at Jerusalem, we were bound to imitate their example. Campbell believed communitarianism would result in ruin and confusion when practiced by large multitudes of converts. McKernan reports, When Rigdon would not change his mind and rescind his proposal, quote, there occurred at this meeting a passage at arms between Mr. Campbell and Mr. Rigdon, end of quote. Campbell, who had often stated that his restoration represented the New Testament church, was forced to argue that Rigdon's proposal did not represent the practices of the primitive church at Jerusalem. See article in Christian Chronicler. That's a link right there. It was, so that was the end of the quote there. It was Rigdon's literalist views of the New Testament and his passionate integrity for wanting to duplicate the principles in the Bible as the standard for organizing churches that caused him to part ways with Campbell and to accept an opportunity extended by a group of people living in and around Kirtland, Ohio to preach to their congregation. Little did Rigdon know that the Spirit of the Lord was guiding him to prepare the hearts and minds of many people for a restoration of the gospel and to understand the doctrine of consecration and to accept the restored gospel. When Parley P. Pratt, Elder O. Cowdery, and Peter Whitmer approached Rigdon and told him about the Book of Mormon and a restoration rather than a reformation of the gospel, he read the Book of Mormon and eventually allowed the missionaries to speak to one of his congregations just before he submitted himself to baptism. Here's an account given by Parley P. Pratt. Quote, we called on Elder Sidney Rigdon, and then for the first time his eyes beheld the Book of Mormon, I myself had the happiness to present it to him in person. He was much surprised, and it was with much persuasion and argument that he was prevailed on to read it. And after he had read it, he had a great struggle of mind. Therefore, before he fully believed and embraced it, and when finally convinced of its truth, he called together a large congregation of his friends, neighbors, and brethren, and then addressed them very affectionately for nearly two hours, during most of which time both himself and nearly all the congregation were melted into tears. 
he asked forgiveness of every body who might have had occasion to be offended with any part of his former life. He forgave all who had persecuted or injured him in any manner, and the next morning himself and wife were baptized by Elder O. Cowdery. I was present. It was a solemn scene. Most of the people were greatly affected. They came out of the water overwhelmed in tears. Many others were baptized by us in that vicinity, both before and after his baptism, insomuch that during the fall of 1830 and the following winter and spring, the number of disciples were increased to about 1,000. The Holy Ghost was mightily poured out, and the Word of God grew and multiplied, and many priests were obedient to the faith. Early in 1831, Mr. Rigdon, having been ordained under our hands, visited Elder J. Smith, Jr., in the state of New York for the first time, and from that time forth rumor began to circulate that he, Rigdon, was the author of the Book of Mormon. End of quote. Imagine giving up your congregation and your living as Rigdon did. If you're wondering why Rigdon felt compelled to ask forgiveness to the congregation, it's because we Latter-day Saints forget that the Scriptures command us to publicly confess our sins prior to baptism. When was the last time you witnessed a new convert stand before the ward or a group of friends and confess their sins and ask for forgiveness prior to baptism? Rigdon took the principles of the gospel very literally and very seriously. It appears that Sidney was baptized on or about November 7, 1830. Within less than a month after getting baptized, Rigdon went to visit the Prophet Joseph Smith. One has to wonder if there was any jealousy felt by people like Parley P. Pratt and David Whitner and others when Rigdon immediately became one of the designated first laborers in the last kingdom and soon after jointly held the keys of the kingdom with Joseph Smith. In part two of this tribute to Sidney Rigdon, we will begin building our scripture profile of Sidney Rigdon and consider the infallible words of the eternal God about Brother Sidney.